of this background. So Dr. Thomas Colgen, he's been a professor in accounting um, at the University of Akron, Ohio for almost 33 years now. He was the chair of the accounting department um, between 2005 to 2018. I hope I get the right. Um, he's currently the editor at Advances in Accounting Education. Um, that's a journal that focuses on research matters within teaching, learning, and curriculum development. Um, Thomas's research is quite extensive and he covers a number of different topics, but most relevant to us is that um, he's covered um, research in big data, um, cybersecurity, um, and more recently, blockchain and ethics. And he's he's been a resource to, to me personally and um, the technology um, staff um, for quite some time. Um, and um, I also get to call him my big brother as well. So I'm really pleased to, to welcome Thomas and um, look forward to the presentation with all of you. Just wanna say thank you very much, Deanne. It's not very often I get to be introduced as my big brother. So that <laughs> is very nice, very sweet. Um, I have turned on my presentation. I'm in presentation mode right now. And uh, today I'm gonna to speak about uh, blockchain and the profession, but uh, my emphasis will be on ethics. Um, I spent a lot of time discussing some background information, not background information related to what is blockchain, but largely what is blockchain doing or how is blockchain being received in the business environment? And then spend some time discussing what the academic literature says about blockchain and uh, the uh, transformative effects of blockchain. I do not spend time talking about the fundamentals of blockchain. I have several examples that I use throughout my presentation. And you will see that much of my, many of my examples focus on the ethical aspects of blockchain. Now, uh, throughout the presentation, what I'd like to do or what I'd like to assure is that anyone who wishes to chime in either ask a question or add a slightly different perspective or perhaps just uh, make a comment. I would appreciate that quite a lot. I do not want to feel as though I'm lecturing and I'm just lecturing to a screen. So chime in as you see fit. Now, as I said, I'm going to emphasize ethics. The accounting literature has looked at uh, quite a few topics, including implications of blockchain for accounting education, operational aspects of blockchain technology, leveraging general blockchain capabilities, blockchain audit pro and audit processes, blockchain and ESG. Many of these things have been looked at in the accounting literature. What is missing to a very large extent is a very good discussion on blockchain and ethics. Now, um, Dirk Meyer and Sealy, they made that point in a 2020 article. And I thought it was a very good point in the sense that in searching through the literature, I had not seen very much in the account of literature in particular on blockchain and ethics. So this is what I'm going to emphasize. Now I have some observations about blockchain in the business world, uh, based to a very large extent on the accounting literature. The first thing I would like to say is that blockchain is already diffusing through the business world. It's diffusing through a very, at a very, very rapid pace. And many, blockchain proponents indicate that 
it will offer unprecedented levels of accuracy and transparency for the business world. Blockchain is often described by academics and practitioners who are proponents of blockchain as impactful, disruptive, and transformative. Now, one of the things that that type of language does is that it literally turns on a light bulb in my head, impactful, disruptive, and transformative. It turns on a light bulb. And if a technology is as impactful, as disruptive, and as transformative, one would expect to see quite a few disclosures in the 10K reports of companies that are filed with the SEC every year, or perhaps in the 8K reports that are filed with the SEC. Unfortunately, I looked at in quite a lot of detail a random sample of about 3,000 disclosures. And uh, I didn't see that kind of impact. I didn't see very much evidence of disruption. I didn't see very much evidence of transformation, except in the case of entities that provide the blockchain service. So I was looking for more. In fact, I'm still looking for more. And so myself and my co-author, we are searching all 10 cases that have been filed between 2016 and 2021 to determine whether or not there are any disclosures that fit this impactful, disruptive, and transformative label. So far, we have not found many other than those disclosures that are made by service providers. We know that whatever impact blockchain has, it will have implications for professional accountants. We know that. And much of the literature makes that, make that point very clearly. This slide is actually a very interesting slide, very intriguing slide for me, because I would say three years ago, I wouldn't think that there would be as many as 50 very impactful and transformative real world cases where blockchain was being used. But if you take a look at this slide, you will see that blockchain is being used in government. Basically, they are being used in government to manage international logistics. You will see that blockchain, IBM, a service provider, is using Hyperledger Fabric blockchain in China to monitor carbon offset trading. You will see that supply, that, that blockchain is being used by Walmart, developed by IBM, of course, to facilitate or to manage the supply chain. You will also see that blockchain is being used by uh, De Beers Group to track the importation and sale of diamonds. Many of you may have heard of uh, blood diamonds. Well, blockchain could be a very useful approach to tracking blood diamonds. You will notice that in China, a tax-based initiative is being used or is being facilitated with blockchain technology. And you will see that energy companies, multiple energy companies are working with blockchain to facilitate essentially part of the energy management programs that they have. Google, you will see on this list, Google is building its own blockchain, which will be integrated into the cloud, into its cloud services, and will enable businesses to store data in the cloud utilizing blockchain. Now, needless to say, we are not sure, or I'm not sure whether or not Google is going to build a public blockchain, which implies that anyone and everyone will be able to access the blockchain and participate in the blockchain and see records in the blockchain, but that's very doubtful. It is more likely that Google is going to build a, 
permission blockchain or build permission blockchains for individual um, clients as needed, individual companies as needed. So there are many applications of blockchain in business and you would agree probably that many of these applications are transformative. I wanna go back to this slide that I just moved on here. I wanna point out that the World Economic Forum in a separate document indicated that 10% of the global GDP will be stored on the blockchain by 2025. Now that's a prediction and you will see my perspectives on predictions such as these. But this is a very important and very impactful prediction. What is also interesting about the World Economic Forum's work in this particular space is that they did a survey of companies in, I think it was about uh, two years ago, about a year and a half ago, the survey was completed and published in 2020. What this is showing is that there are many technologies that will be impactful and disruptive. And you can see that distributed ledger technology is going to be one of those impactful and transform transformative technologies. In fact, 11% of entities that were surveyed indicated that blockchain will be impactful and transformative. Now that's a global survey. Now there are other classifications of blockchain technologies, classifications of what to expect in the future with regards to blockchain. This is a very simple one. I like it because of the fact that it lists all of the technologies, all of the major technologies that are out there. And then it classifies them in terms of adoption, trial, assessing, and exploring. Exploring implies that the technology is emerging. Not many people have actually adopted the technology or not many entities have adopted the technology, but the technology is emerging sufficiently that most entities are at least familiar with it Many entities are exploring the potential applications of the technology in their spaces. Blockchain, as you could see, has actually passed this explore level. Blockchain is classified in this chart as essentially a technology that many businesses are assessing. As you can see from my prior slide, not only are businesses assessing this technology, businesses are actually employing the technology. To a, to a certain extent, although in this classification, which is done from a banking perspective, although in this classification, blockchain is listed in the assess category, we know that businesses are trying the technology. And so it is possible that one would not be wrong if one moves blockchain from the assess category to at least the early adoption or the trial category. So that's where blockchain is classified at least in this study here. Now, there are many implications for accounting. According to the literature, there will also be implications for accounting education. In fact, Zhang et al. They are predicting that the traditional mix of jobs in accounting firms will change substantially and accountants will need to learn new skills as more traditional tasks become automated and the technical maintenance and analytic needs of the work increase substantively. That's their basic prediction. They believe that the technologies are disruptive. They believe that among those technologies which are very disruptive are robotic 
process of automation, artificial intelligence, blockchain and smart contracts and analytics. They also note that these developments or developments in these technologies in the business world are way ahead of what accounting students are currently learning. What this implies is that there is a gap between what is happening in practice in the context of those disruptive technologies and what is happening in the classroom. And so their conclusion is that we really need to change in, a, in the academy what we teach our students. Now, needless to say, there is a lot of truth in that. And it's not necessarily true for, with regards to only technology, it is it true with regard to many other areas in the context of accounting and certainly financial reporting as well. This is what I refer to as a mind map of how uh, Wang and Kogan see blockchain. They view blockchain as being among the most disruptive and promising emerging technologies. They also believe that blockchain has the potential for significantly affecting accounting and auditing. Accordingly, what they are doing in their paper, their paper develops a prototype for a blockchain enabled transaction processing system. Alex Kogan, Alex is one of those real-time accounting, continuous monitoring uh, researchers. He has done a lot of work in this. So in essence, he is hitting on this real-time accounting and continuous monitoring services. He's hitting on that and saying that, golly, blockchain can be used for that purpose. And he's correct, given the real-time nature of blockchain, given the fact that in a blockchain environment, everyone supposedly has access to the same records. So with regards to real time, as soon as a transaction takes place in blockchain, in theory, if you have a permission blockchain, everyone within the scope of the permission blockchain will see the transaction. So you do have quite a lot of scope for continuous monitoring and, continu and real time accounting. These authors believe that because of the nature of the blockchain, the blockchain will prevent transaction fraud and deliver guaranteed confidential confidentiality protection. That's a big statement. Guaranteed confi confidentiality protection. That is, that is their thesis, but Wang and Kogan recognize that management managers are concerned about their confidentiality and business secrets. And the nature of public blockchains and indeed private blockchains, permission blockchains, is such that everyone who has a node on the blockchain is going to see everything. They're going to see every transaction. So what they're proposing is something called, first of all, a permission blockchain, which uses zero knowledge proof, proof to address the issue of um, privacy and security. Zero knowledge proof implies that in that permission blockchain, only a subset of the information will be shared with non-owners. And what that implies is that non-owners could prove that a transaction existed by looking at perhaps the metadata associated with a transaction as opposed to all of the details of a transaction. Now, Wang and Kogan also believe that their system, their proposed system can be used to support all of the enterprises information systems needs. So in essence, what they're proposing here is that the blockchain can be used to create, in quotes, a blockchain enabled financial information system. Pretty much an ERP that is built 
on blockchain technologies. Now, Dan O'Leary made a similar proposal. He believes that the blockchain can be used to support enterprise systems. In another article, we have two individuals here, Benson and my friend Reza Baki. These two individuals are saying that we really need to understand the impact of the blockchain, not necessarily just on transactions and transactions processing or on just financial statements in general. We really need to understand the impact of blockchain and smart contracts on the assessment of internal controls. That's a huge issue. The presumption in accounting and financial reporting in particular is that the financial statements are prepared based on a foundation of strong internal controls. But Vincent and Barkey are stating that distributed ledgers and smart contracts will blur the system boundaries between trading partners. If you recall in the COSO framework, the integrated framework, the entity is the highest level in internal control. But what is important in the context of blockchain, even in a permission blockchain, is that there are many different entities that might very well be at that highest level. So these two authors are suggesting that there is a need to understand whether internal controls based on a single company approach is adequate in an integrated and collaborative environment. This is a big statement and they're not necessarily the only ones who have made that statement. In fact, they are recognizing that the current frameworks, both for the integrated internal control framework and the enterprise risk framework do not adequately address this issue. Along with their thinking, COSO recently came out with a white paper on blockchain and internal control. And they very much acknowledge this fact that the integrated framework as currently written and the enterprise risk management framework do not sufficiently address this color collaborative issue with regards to modern blockchains and smart contracts. In another article, we have two individuals, Glenn Gray and Michael Ellis. These two individuals are saying that there is a huge first mile problem or there could be a huge first mile problem when blockchain is used to store data about physical items. The issue that they are raising here is that we could think of, let's say something called business information intensity. That's a, just a concept, just a concept. Business information intensity. Business information intensity has to do with the extent to which the supply chain is digital and the product that is being made or the project that pr product that is being produced is also digital. To the extent that you have digital supply chains, digital products, you could have a seamless blockchain because the blockchain will be representing digital things and digital things in a blockchain might be easier to verify in many different contexts than let's say physical items. And so these authors are concerned that the blockchain may not be a good representation of physical assets that involve particularly a service, comp for service component as opposed to being a blockchain which represents items that have high business information intensity, such as, for example, digital currency. Now, in general, what is interesting here is that these authors believe that accountants can be trained 
to deal with this first mile issue. But we need to make sure that their training embodies the right amount of professional skepticism. If accountants do not get trained with that right amount of professional skepticism, it is quite possible that they may ignore the first mile problem. And they may not recognize the nuances between, let's say, a blockchain that is enabled to uh, record and to maintain or facilitate business that is purely digital versus a blockchain that exists to record and to maintain business with regards to physical items that also involve a service component. It, is, it was interesting to me to see that notwithstanding the fact that accountants might be trained to develop the right amount of professional, right levels of professional skepticism. Alice, Michael Alice and Glenn Gray, they're saying there, there is no guarantee that the new demand for the type of first mile service that might be needed will be met by the traditional financial statement auditors. That is a huge issue. And it's an issue that I would say that academics as well as uh, regulators should be very concerned about. Now, uh, Thomas, if I, if I may, if you don't, if that's okay, um, I, I'd just like to jump in just on this issue of first mile problem. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on, uh, you know, just so I can better understand what the what precisely the first mark problem is. I, I guess I can understand, uh, uh, I guess some some practical challenges in terms of physical items, physical assets, uh, you know, the tracking the movement of a physical asset through the supply chain, you know, um, uh, you know, opportunities for potentially fraud, fraudulent. Uh, uh, inserting fraudulent um, uh, actions, uh, you know, along the way uh, of the supply chain. But what 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 is it that that is a particular problem when an asset an asset has a service component? I'm I'm just trying to under better understand this this is. problem. It results because when you're dealing with physical assets, one of the big issues, for example, is the issue of existence. Okay. Does that physical asset exist? It may be on the books, but does the item existing on the books in the blockchain, does it imply that that item also exists as a physical item somewhere in a warehouse? That's an example of a first mile problem. Did that answer your question? Uh, not, not, not so. I, not so much, I guess. I mean, uh, I can understand uh, potentially uh, an issue of existence with this physical asset, but what is it that that is so important to be concerned to be thinking about in terms of the service component? Well, uh, that's attached to an asset. Part of the issue. Part of the issue is that. In contrast with assets that are purely digital, assets that have high business information intensity, the blockchain is essentially a self-contained or can be a self-contained record. In, our, in essence, the blockchain itself might provide evidence of existence. Okay, the blockchain itself might provide evidence combined with let's say, uh, a smart contract might provide evidence of valuation. The blockchain itself might provide evidence of perhaps cutoffs. But when you're dealing with physical items, particularly items that might involve a service component, which may not necessarily reside on the blockchain, all this is saying is that the accountant needs to be cognizant of that. And you will see an example as we, uh, as we go through the discussion. 
Ken, Ken and Thomas, can I maybe provide another example of, of how I think of the first mile issue? Um, in a supply chain context for inventory, and if I think back to the, that, that wine supply chain, where the goal is to basically assure the eventual buyer of a bottle of wine that that bottle really was produced by a certain company that the grapes came from a particular vineyard in France, blah, blah, blah. And that's why uh, it should be valued at a certain amount. All of that depends on the, that first mile issue of originally recording those grapes appropriately, that they really were at that vineyard, that they are of a certain quality, that, you know, that the company purchased them and that they entered the production stream. Absolutely everything after that in the production process and eventually sale to a distributor and a, you know, and a retail store or whatever, all depends on that first issue of recording the grapes appropriately. Because if that gets screwed up and, and the grapes actually were some third party generic grapes from a different country, uh, it, it, you've, you've completely ruined the entire process. So it's really that beginning process and the, the first recording of data, and really then the recording of data at every point in the, in the blo on the blockchain. That, that is actually a good example. The same thing is true about letters. Um, um, Walmart, for example, after they had that big scare with salmonella, they decided to go ahead and use blockchain for the supply chain, particularly in the context of veg fresh vegetables. And the same sort of issues would arise. And the issue arises to a large extent because there is a disparity between the physical and the digital. The physical exists, and then we create the digital, assuming, of course, that we picked up the right physical, match the right physical with the digital, and do everything consistently with that right physical. That is part of the first my problem. Thank you for that explanation. Now, bear in mind that not everyone is a huge proponent of blockchain because there are certain things that are still unknown. Some questions that pop up include, is the blockchain the internet of our time? In other words, it's transformative or it could be transformative. Is it a disruptive technology or is it just an overhyped phenomenon? That is something that exists out there. People ask those questions. And not Graham at all in a, in a paper published in ACR and Oxford Journal of Finance and Risk Perspectives, they brought up those types of issues. And those types of issues will have implications, not just for the blockchain in the context of recording, but they will have implications for blockchain in the context of professional ethics. And we'll discuss some of those. In the context of people who doubt, people who are skeptics, bear in mind that there is something called a technology adoption cycle. And it always seemed to happen almost the same way with regards to transformative technologies. First of all, there is a lot of hype. There is a lot of expectation. Then you have what is referred to as a trough of disillusionment. In other words, people get less enthusiastic about the technology. We saw that to, or we have seen that to a certain extent with blockchain in 2017, 2018. People talked about blockchain as though it was the next coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? But folks got a lot more realistic. And this is what we are seeing. We are seeing now somewhat of a plateau and uh, the interest in blockchain, I think is get, beginning to get a lot more profound and a lot more realistic. Now, the interesting aspect of blockchain is that given the fact that it is transformative, given the fact that it is disruptive, it is likely going to look a lot more like the adoption of the internet in business. That's 
my thinking, but I'm never 100% correct with regards to predictions about technology. Okay, if I were, then I would be in the major leagues and I would be uh, probably a very big, big superstar. So what I'm going to say, it is likely that blockchain adoption from this point might look like what happened to the internet. In other words, the internet, people got to know about the internet or the public got to know about the internet, although it existed for a very long time. The public got to know about the internet in the 1990s. And by 2005, practically everyone had some sort of internet impact in their business or in their personal lives. Having said that, and having doubted my prediction to a certain extent, part of my prediction is embedded in, or part of my skepticism is embedded in the Rumsfeld matrix. I recall when uh, Donald Rumsfeld made his statement about known knowns and known unknowns in 2002. I, I thought it was perhaps the biggest joke out there. But actually, Rumsfeld did have something to say, something very, very profound to say, particularly when we look at this whole context or this whole concept of known knowns and known unknowns in the context of technology. What I want to point out here is that there are different levels of awareness with regards to technology. There are different facts that are known with regards to technology. And so if we look at technology from the standpoint of the Rumsfeld matrix, we will find that there are things that we are aware of and understand, no knowns. We'll find that there are things that we are aware of but do not fully understand. These are known unknowns. Things that we understand but are not aware of, unknown knowns, and then unknown unknowns. What this tells me is that there are certain things that we need to resolve, the known knowns. There are certain things that we need to research, the known unknowns. But then we end up in what I refer to as, excuse me. Then we end up in what we refer to as a zone of ignorance, bias, and screw ups. And this happens because there is a lot of uncertainty with regards to what might happen in the context of those technologies where there are lots of unknown knowns, lots of unknown unknowns. And so from the standpoint of ethics, there are still a lot of unknown knowns, unknown unknowns, because of course, we do not have an infinite list of cases. In fact, number of real cases that might affect ethics are somewhat limited, but we have to, we have to take a look at research associated with this issue. And in some instances, we could go right ahead and resolve the cases that we have. Having said that, no knowns in the context of blockchain. We know that blockchain is currently in use. We know that blockchain is being or will be supplemented with other technologies. We know that. Here's an example of how blockchain might be used with other technologies. We have an individual or a business, Bill Inc. Bill, Bill wants to sell boats. Bill is in the business of selling boats. We are going to assume that Bill is also using smart contracts. Okay? And we are going to assume that Bill is going to, or Bill has enabled his entire supply chain with blockchain. So here we have this case. Bill wants to purchase, or Bill wants to sell this boat. We have a customer, the customer wants to buy the boat. Phyllis is the name. And so what's going to happen is that Bill and Phyllis are going to uh, 
get together, at least digitally, and they're going to contract to get a boat. All of this information about the contract would be embedded in blockchain. But this information at this point is all digital. Now we want Phyllis to get her boat. Well, what we might do is to utilize the internet of things. And Phyllis might be able to get her boat because Bill Inc. will unlock the boat, which is currently uh, protected in the warehouse. Bill is going to unlock the boat digitally using a key. And so Phyllis could send her trucker or her delivery person, or Bill could do it, send the delivery person to pick up the boat and have Phyllis take possession. The first mile problem arises here. The first mile problem in this particular case might be a problem associated with the physical properties of this boat and assurance that Phyllis is going to get the boat for which she has contracted. That's a huge issue. Now, in the context of auditing, this type of issue becomes a big one because typically in auditing and in ethics, certainly, we make certain assumptions about owners. We make certain assumptions about transactions. We make certain assumptions about financial statements. Typically, we make assumptions or assertions for the period on the audit. We make assumptions or assertions for the uh, end of the period on the audit. Basically, financial statements, assertions, balance sheet assertions. And we are all aware or should might be all aware of those types of assertions. But let's think of this. We have this boat issue. We have an inventory of boats, okay? The question for us as auditors or as uh, financial controllers or as CFOs, the question is, what does this, what does use of the blockchain mean in the context of Bill's inventory management? What evidence, what evidence might be needed to verify, let's say the management assertions that Bill Inc. might may, make in the context of preparing and auditing, those, auditing the financial statements. There are certainly assertions that might reflect rights and obligations, existence, completeness, valuation, etc. Now bear in mind, that the blockchain may not necessarily be sufficient to confirm or to obtain the evidence to confirm rights and obligations, existence, com completeness, valuation. And so we do have a challenge. Our challenge revolves around this, what I refer to as an evidence chain as opposed to just evidence. An evidence chain in this context implies that we might be using RPA, we might be using artificial intelligence, we might be using the internet of things, we might be using blockchain as we have said, and smart contracts. All of this facilitates Bill Inc's buying and selling as well as storing boats. So we need, as accountants, we need evidence or we need an evidence chain to support all of these issues. And in the process, several important ethical issues arise. And those issues are really related to the fundamental ethics principles that ISB espouses. Here's an example. Professional ethics challenge number one. Lou et al. suggests that auditors should elevate themselves 
to the role of strategic partners in the blockchain, okay, in blockchain implementation. That is an interesting perspective. In fact, it's an intriguing one, but there are going to be very significant implications with regards to this comment here or this action if auditors should be involved as strategic partners in the blockchain. What are those, are some of those ethical, com ethical implications if the auditor or the auditor's audit firm was consulted and received no fees? Or if the auditor was consulted and received a fee? The auditor was contracted to design and build any of the systems in the evidence chain. What are some of the ethical implications here? And bear in mind that there would be many. For example, you could have a situation where the auditor might very well be self auditing You could have that situation. Needless to say, the auditor may have to protect himself or herself. But at the same time, that issue is a huge issue when we are dealing with an evidence chain as opposed to just, let's say, traditional types of evidence. Professional ethics challenge number two. An accountant employed by a listed company accepts an assignment to provide oversight for the elements in an evidence chain. Although the accountant is fully aware that at the time of accepting the assignment, he is or he has no background in any of the areas that make up the evidence chain. This presents a huge ethical challenge. In other words, what role should auditors and accountants adopt in the creation of blockchain enabled systems, particularly in situations where they are new to the technology. That's a huge ethical issue and it brings up issues with regards to competence and due professional care. It brings up issues with regards to professional skepticism. There are several issues that will arise and one of those issues which need to be researched basically as part of the known unknowns is the ethics and professional responsibility implications of blockchain enabled systems. Here is something that would be very germane to digital systems. We know, we know that RPA, AI, blockchain, smart contracts, what I call uh, blockchain plus, we know that these types of system might very well exist. And these types of systems exist to a very large extent in a distributed, in, in, in the context of a distributed system. In other words, they exist on several different computer nodes in a permission blockchain, as well as in a public blockchain. So issues such as confidentiality in the CIA triangle, those issues become hugely important. Who sees what? Who gets access to private keys in the possession of the accountant? Issues related to integrity. Could the accountant over rely on the blockchain and assess zero risk to the likelihood of errors and omissions? What if the accountant becomes aware of an off-chain transaction after closing and after submitting financial statements to executives and the board and no other person is aware of those off-chain transactions? These are huge issues. I'm not aware of any real world cases that prompt this question, but those cases can exist. In other words, 
you may have information asymmetry in the context of the blockchain. And the only person who is aware of those asymmetries might be the accountant. A huge issue. Then availability. This is something that's in the news. Systems are not always available. But what if data in a system is available only to the accountant? With whom should the accountant share that information? That's a huge responsibility that brings up ethical challenges. But most importantly, with regards to availability, what if the system is not available because of a ransomware attack and the accountant needs the data on the system to meet a critical deadline? Should the accountant advocate pain or don't pay? Should the accountant secretly pay? I presume the accountant has a budget. Ransomware is interesting. Ransomware is one of those phenomena where the, the perpetrator charges a relatively low fee because he knows or she knows that the entity is going to pay if the fee is sufficiently low. And insurance companies up until now have encouraged companies or victims to pay up because it is a lot cheaper for the insurance company to pay the ransom than for them to pay for all of the losses that might result if the ransom is not paid. So we have a huge dilemma. And for the accountant in particular, we have a very significant ethical issue, all within the context of the CIA triangle. But here is another issue. Typically, in auditing, we try to strike the right balance. But striking that right, right balance in the context of either internal or external audit also requires that the accountant should have the right perceptions about blockchain and related technologies. If the accountant completely accepts blockchain capabilities, or if the accountant completely denies blockchain capabilities, we are unlikely to strike the correct balance. And so the question arises, is an, an auditor at either end of this continuum complying with I as the code? It is a huge issue, particularly for early adopters and auditors that audit early adopters. Is an auditor who fails to seek out the right balance on this continuum complying with the code? That's another huge issue. One might say that accountants, to be ethical, they should have the right level of professional skepticism. But in a new technology that is, or in the context of a new technology that is emerging so rapidly, and is likely to have such transformative effects, one has to wonder whether or not it is an issue with regards to just skepticism, or does the issue run beyond skepticism? Now, here is an issue that's discussed in the literature, which again is eye-catching when the account or when the accountant, excuse me, I have a typo here, when the accountant is unethical, what do you do? Well, typically NASBA, the AICPA and some of the uh, regulators in the US and around the world, they maintain a list of entities or accountants who have violated professional ethics. And that list to a very large extent is private. Although in states like let's say Ohio and many other states across the country, that list is shared. Well, this author, Sheldon, he is proposing that we use the blockchain 
to keep a record, an immutable record of the accountant's misconduct. With blockchain, all key constituents in the accountant profession can work together and share the information. Also, these authors believe that this type of blockchain enabled system is going to assure zero risk of a single entity taking control of the data. So in essence, there are huge implications for record keeping when the accountant is unethical. We hope that accountants are never unethical, but it does happen and we do have to keep records. So the question becomes, given all we have talked about and given all we have known, we have, uh, that we know about uh, blockchain, what is missing? Well, I would argue that there is still a missing need for research on ethics and blockchain or ethics and in general, transformative technologies. We know that uh, ethics can go beyond just accounting. We know that. We know that ethics could have implications for ESG. We know that ethics could have implications for, or blockchain in particular, could have implications for criminal lengths or criminal elements to exploit various opportunities and uh, various transactions that might be facilitated by the blockchain. We know that. We know that there is the possibility of crypto jacking by our outsiders. In other words, outsiders might send companies um, technology that looks like good bona fide technology for enabling the blockchain. But what happens or what could happen is that those outsiders might very well take over the company's blockchain, blockchain transactions. That can happen. Cyberjacking, insiders could do a similar thing. We know that there could be disruptive effects, illegal content in the distributed, distributed ledger and computer owners defects. What is the defense, for example, if the blockchain contains illegal items? Let's say something like child pornography. Okay, what if the blockchain contains that? Now remember that that blockchain, the transactions on that blockchain will be sitting on your servers if it's a public blockchain, if it's a private blockchain, it might very well be sitting on your server as well. And so if you have that illegal content that some third party enters into the blockchain, what are the implications? What are the defenses? You can't say the computer did it or the blockchain did it because it's on your server. So these questions are very important. They extend far beyond what accountants would normally uh, consider, yet they are very important. Now, one thing that we tend not to do too much of is we do not necessarily recognize the favorable consequences of blockchain enabled systems in the context of ethics. So for example, transparency is often thought of as a good thing, an ethical thing. Traceability of ownership is often thought of as a good thing. But for the most part, this is something that is ethically favorable. It is an ethically favorable consequence of blockchain. And it might be useful or important for academics and even practitioners to study some of the ways in which blockchain make business ethically more favorable. Recognizing ethically ambivalent transactions. And there are several of those potentially ethically amb ambivalent transactions in the blockchain space. 
and then privacy and transparency as competent issues with moral and ethical application implications. These are all issues that can be studied further and we would benefit as academics and in the profession, we would benefit a lot more by knowing more about those unknowns. Finally, I want to ask if you have any questions. Now, my perspective is that frequently, if the audience has no questions, it might imply 